Good morning, everyone. Welcome to the, today's webinar, where we're going to be going over unlocking the value of PAT. We're going to also hear from some market leaders, and we're going to learn about fast tracking your results. Just real quick before we get started, uh, this webinar is planning on running 30 minutes, but it is being recorded, so don't feel free to leave and come back. Uh, it, a recording will be emailed to you after. And again, also, you have the chance of asking questions. This is a discussion format, and my colleagues will be joining me here in a second. But please feel free to use, utilize the chat feature and ask your questions throughout uh, today's webinar. So just a real quick background on Camo Analytics. Camo has been in the game since 1984. Uh, I'm pretty sure everyone is aware of our MVA tools. We have the unscrambler, and we also have on the online side, process pulse, and that's really very relevant to the conversation we're gonna be having today around PAT, because you know, PAT is very, you know, it's been around since 2004 when initiative was passed down from the FDA, but there's a lot of stuff that's going on that's bringing the conversations back to the forefront. It's actually beginning to be trending. So let's, without further ado, I'm gonna be introducing my two colleagues who'll be joining me. And they'll be, uh, I guess, turning on their webcams as we get rolling here. Oh, there he is. And I guess uh, I could introduce uh, the first person who joined was the PAT veteran. He's a career long journey in PAT. He's been around a long time. Uh, the one and only Chuck Miller. <laughs> Thank, thanks a lot, Jeff. Yeah, just a quick introduction. I'm uh, a chief data scientist at Camo Analytics uh, based in uh, Lansdale, PA, which is close to Philadelphia. I started my journey in 1985 um, in what was called process analytical chemistry and chemometrics back then. Uh, so that means about, I guess, doing a math 30 to 35 years in process analytics. Uh, about 13 of that was at Merck Pharmaceuticals. And then also before that was DuPont. All right, thanks, Chuck. And then we have the guy on side of, on side of him or on bottom of him, whatever, which way you're viewing the webcams. He's uh, known as the PT visionary in his parts of the woods. Uh, he's coming out of Norway, he's in Oslo. He has uh, scars to show and also successes along with them. The one and only Garuna. Yeah, thank you, Jeff. Yes, that's, uh, <laughs> thank you for that. And yes, I've been working with the PAT for a while as well, uh, starting out in academia, uh, working both in, uh, in Norway, in Bergen, out of the University of Bergen and also uh, having a spell in CPACT in the UK uh, before we were working industrially and uh, the longest spell in industry I had in GSK before I was moving to, to Como. And in Como today, I'm working uh, a lot with our solutions. And, and that means that I have these dialogues with our customers and trying to solve their problems using our, our tools. Great, thanks Garuna. And you know, Garuna also collects plants in his spare time. You can see behind yeah. him a couple <laughs> oh, well, that is like green fingers, isn't it? <laughs> green thumb over here. Yeah, okay. <laughs> All right, thanks, guys. Well, let's, let's get into the heat of things. We only have 30 minutes here, but we're going to try to make the most of it. So we're going to be going into understanding the full potential. So what does that really mean? You know, if we look at this slide, we have back in 2017 a market of 1.7 billion. And that's expected to grow over the next, let's see if I do the math here, you know, six years to 4 billion. Uh, Gabriel, what are your thoughts on the, some of the drivers that are, you know, recognizing this growth here? Yeah, I, th I think this is a good slide because it gives a nice overview of the, I would say obvious drivers, which is uh, happening out there. Uh, but also there is a bigger picture here, which is relating to this uh, digitalization, which we see in pharma and in other industries. Uh, and that is obviously the, more strategic approach to use more more data and more information along the operation. So that that's also pushing the uh, the whole ID forward. Yeah. So you say PAT is a, a pretty much a digitalization initiative that would kind of make your company, you know, adhere to the guidelines or at least try to reach those goals. Yeah, definitely. Because digitalization is all about having available information in real time, right? And, and PAT is all about translating sensors into actionable results in real time uh, and uh, often advanced sensors, which means that you're, you're not only getting 
pointers, but you're also getting insight into your into your actual chemistry in in your processes. So definitely, uh, PAT is an important part of the digitalization. I would say. Great. The one thing I wanted to mention too, lower right part of this slide, uh, PAT has been around as an acronym for 16 years, and yet uh, the next six years we expect to see more than doubling uh, of the uh, expenditures uh, of the market. So this is a big difference from the first 16 years. Yeah, you could say. I mean, some of the drivers are pretty relevant here, and. And also, we can't we can't forget about just what's going on right now with the pandemic. That's another fast forwarding thing that's actually having companies rethink their initiatives and getting those uh, goals fast forwarded. So, working for Camo, we deal with a lot of customers like this on the screen, and a lot of times we can't talk about some of the things we're doing just because of different privacy, you know, concerns. But we did reach out to this to, to our customers here and to get some th their thoughts around PAT or. In, they were willing to share uh, the following quotes from them. We have uh, one from Bayer, uh, Andreas Litska, PAT engineer. Hmm. And, and this is a really good one because uh, Andreas is pointing out that, uh, yes, we will get uh, results and benefits from PAT uh, from the outset, from, from starting using it. But there is also some sort of future here, which is uh, unspecified and giving us enormous opportunities. Because obviously, the more knowledge we have, the better insight we have into our processes and the better we can run them. So great statement by, by Andreas there. Good points, Kevin. And now we're going to move to the next. This comes from CPAC. It's uh, Martin Warman. Yeah, uh, the way I read this uh, quote is control through understanding. So, uh, of course, part of the QBD philosophy is, um, you know, process understanding, and through that understanding, more improved state of control of the process. Uh, this is similar to the old Six Sigma philosophy in the uh, control stage of Six Sigma, the fifth stage, which is locking in the gains that you make early on. Uh, this is particularly important for continuous manufacturing and innovative uh, advanced manufacturing where there are much fewer opportunities uh, for intervention and that for therefore driving more uh, proactive control. Great, great points, Chuck. We're going to move on to the next here, and this one comes from dispersal, and I'll let Chuck kind of run through this one yeah this yeah Angela yeah Angela Steinberg this is a, a small outfit uh, startup based in the great city of Austin Texas uh, in a very innovative compounding technology for low solubility APIs and farm products uh, and for this innovative uh, technology it's very crit one of the critical parameters is polymorphic uh, properties or polymorphic analysis. And so PAT is actually an enabler for Adline uh, as an Adline IPC or in process control. Um, the other nice thing about this is these guys are pretty small. Uh, PAT isn't just for the big guys. Um, it, small guys can get involved too. That's a good point, Chuck. Moving on to Pfizer, uh, Andy Palm. Everyone, what are your thoughts around this uh, quote from Andy? Yeah, again, he is um, uh, he is spot on. All of our customers is actually spot on. But the point that Andy is making is this uh, point about advanced manufacturing platforms, and uh, that's that's a generic term, of course. But uh, I would believe that in in this instance, uh, Andy is probably pointing to, to continuous manufacturing setups. Uh, and of course, if you are doing continuous manufacturing, then then you are in a situation where uh, you have um, consistent or continuous flow, obviously, from the starting materials all the way to the product. Uh, and if that is going to be realized and possible at all, you are really relying on strong PAT methods, which can give you real-time insight into how your rig is performing and then helping you to take the appropriate actions to uh, adjust your rig back onto the, onto the main track or into the golden uh, trajectory, if you like. Thanks, Gabriela. Yeah, advanced manufacturing, you hear that a lot lately. Uh, move on yeah, to Lanza. Yes, and again, uh, this is a good statement. And, and Lonza, um, I've been working with Lonza for a while while I've been in um, in uh, Carmel. 
Uh, and they have had all the way through when we have been working with them, they've had really some nice, uh, nice ideas and some uh, really strong visions about what PAT can do for them and how they can use it in the operational aspects. And what Hans Peter is pointing out here about uh, enhancing understanding and uh, thereby also the control of the manufacturing processes. It's of course exactly what we are trying to achieve through these PAT methods because we have uh, more information which helps us to better understand what's going on and thereby also to, to run things in a, in a better way. And one thing I wanted to jump in there if I may is uh, Lanza and others often serve as contract manufacturing or contract research organizations. Uh, a very important part you know with, with outsourcing business models being prevalent I, I I, you know, it's important that PAT be realized in CMOs and CROs as well as the innovators. Yeah, agree, Trick. Move on from a, a statement from the FDA. Yeah, I guess. And and this is probably where we should be a bit more precise and say that it's not FDA as a body, but it's a former employee of FDA who's uh, stating this. But nevertheless, um, this. Um, uh, person is pointing to the point that okay we are now seeing a renaissance of the PAT methods and this is exactly to your point uh, earlier Jeff that this started out with the white paper from FDA back in 2004 I believe uh, and now uh, due to the things which are starting to, to move in the bigger picture the improved hardware the improved systems the digitalization push and all of that uh, we are seeing that PAT becomes really hot again it, it becomes very relevant for the different companies to actually understand okay uh, what's going on in my process and take those real-time actions and uh, improved operations and this person is uh, capturing that in this really nice uh, statement in my opinion great thanks Garuna. Yeah. it seems like go ahead chuck no 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 i was just uh i didn't mean to uh, cut you off there jeff but uh, uh, yeah the regulators uh, understandably fda and others have very high influence on pharma PAT applications. And uh, in the news right, recently, there have been a lot of talk about regulators about fast tracking and COVID-19 treatments and vaccines. And with regard to that, I just wanted to briefly share a little story about uh, 2016 when our Merck PAT group was approached by the V920 vaccine team, that's the Ebola vaccine team that was charged with commercializing a vaccine in very short order uh, for that out second outbreak or one of the outbreaks in, in the DRC in Africa. So Merck at the time was quite progressive in PAT, but even then we really weren't prepared, I think, to bring the full power of PAT to bear on this uh, public health emergency. So I think at, at the end of the day, I think the public health outcome was positive, but this was a missed opportunity in my opinion, in my personal opinion even for a progressive PAT company. Good point, Chuck. We're going to move on to APC. This comes from Stephen Craven. Yeah, I'm, I'm a bit biased here. All these statements are really powerful. I, I'm uh, personally biased on the large molecule side, having been in that group at Merck. Uh, key term here is maintenance. Uh, PAT can support equipment utility, not just chemical biological processes, uh, things like steam, uh, utility supports. Uh, bioprocess, also second thing I want to mention, bioprocesses, many consider biotech the future of pharma. And so this space sees a lot of innovation, uh, a lot of innovation, innovative processes. And so PAT can be a part, key part of that, things like cell gene therapies and personalized medicine. Finally, uh, biotech, uh, most PAT is upstream right now, but downstream is starting to see more of, of a interest in PAT, things like uh, operations like separations, LIO, long fill, um, starting to get some attention. Great, thanks, Chuck. Yeah, we just heard from some of the, I mean, a lot of market leaders are different, you know, realms of the spectrum. Kevin, what's your take on you know what we just heard and what we went over? Yeah, to sum it up in one word, I would say that it it's inspiring, right? Because these companies they are 
really successful in what we are doing. And we've been talking with some people here. And the statesman, statements they are giving in respect to the benefits they experience and expect from the PAT implementations, I think that is, is really amazing. And I would say that it's, it's a strong lesson here and it's a pointer to that um, this uh, PAT approach or this uh, PAT initiative, it's really something which uh, will give immediate benefits, but it's also uh, uh, something which will give us uh, benefits moving forward and going into the future, getting more understanding of our processes and so forth. So strong statements and inspiring is my take on it. Chuck, do you have anything to kind of add no, to this? No, nothing. Yeah, yeah. That, that, that's exactly what I was thinking. Great. Very inspiring. We're now we're on to the next stage. We're going into kind of uh, unlocking the potential, trying to find out what the value is being realized in PAT. This must be a Garuna slide. It's very busy. He loves this type of slides. They're pretty. With any type of animation, you know, Garuna's behind it. So, <laughs> yeah, it's like a cartoon almost, isn't it? But this is <laughs> this is definitely a complex slide. There's no doubt about it. But there is some structure to it. Uh, central here is of course PAT. Uh, but if we're looking on the text snippets or the words. Um, it's uh, in two uh, colors. It's the it's the white and it's the the black or gray one. Uh, and the white uh, statements or white words that's actually different applications of PAT. And you see a range of them here. And this is only some of them. It's not exhaustive, but it's giving you a flavor of how widespread it is. And uh, the black uh, statements or black words that's more relating to how PAT is um, gripping into the operations and to the activities on a site or in a company. Uh, and again, we see that PAT is very much a something which is multidisciplinary and is gripping into all of the activities really in the company or on a site. And, and that's really worth uh, taking into the future discussion here because it is quite complex, but the upside is quite strong. I'm going to ask one question around the word risk. What are you trying to, what is that signifying when we look at the word risk, that's the black? There are two elements to that because it's one thing that uh, the understanding we are gaining from PAT is helping us to mitigate risk, right? Because the more we know, the more we can contain risk. Uh, and there is also another uh, discussion point really because a lot of the time when we are trying to discuss PAT with people who, who don't fully understand it, uh, they are pointing to the risk of doing PAT. Uh, but our opinion is, of course, that it's quite opposite because through doing PAT, we can reduce the risk. Yeah, it makes sense. And I guess with risk, I mean, there's always some type of risk, but you want to understand what the benefits are you're going to be achieved once you, you know, go down that road of PAT. And I guess this is highlighting some of those benefits uh, Chuck, what, what's your yeah. thoughts around some of the benefits here? Yeah, well, with risk, hopefully comes some reward, and these are all, all kinds of different rewards. Uh, I think the, the relating back to the Ebola story, time to market, uh, trying to streamline commercialization. Uh, uh, you know, we felt we were advanced at the time, but we weren't really ready to bring the full weight to bear there. Uh, on the left, the left hand side, the five hundred thousand dollars uh worth of waste one batch alone that's just the, the the material cost of contents of one bioreactor that would be discarded if the batch failed one in the middle quotes eight hundred thousand dollars per month or i'm sorry uh yeah per month for uh that's a cumulative more of a, a different uh, type savings so it's more cumulative over the course of a month or a year uh through improved throughput um, you know, all these, all these, and these, this isn't a full exhaustive list, you know, COGS, cost of quality. Uh, I just learned another one called inventory reduction um, is also hmm. uh, another benefit. Question around the 500K, you know, how does having PAT save, you know, save that money here, save that, that batch? You know, what yeah. would be? Good question. Yeah. So the way that is, is it, it's, was through in this particular case, it was uh, through what we call the golden batch method, uh, process monitoring, uh, multivariate uh, process monitoring using an online analytics platform yeah. uh, to detect deviations, timely detection of deviations in the process before the batch disposition is already uh, it's too late. Um, 
it's the timely is the key word there. It has to be done in time before in time for a bash to be saved. Makes sense. Thanks, Chuck. Okay. All right, now we're introducing our view on PAT maturity levels. And um, this is our perspective on staging out, you know, implementing PAT. Yeah, and this is where we are trying to uh, make a little bit more sense of that complexity we pointed to earlier, right? Uh, because our thinking here is that um, as the company is uh, starting out, looking at PAT as a possible um, tool they, they want to use, they are very much in the exploratory stage and then developing all the way through to the operationalized stage where it's really a part of what that company is doing. Uh, but if you're looking on the different stages, then as I said, the exploratory stage, that's where we are starting out. We are testing uh, the new methods and we're seeing is PAT something which is feasible for the applications or for the production processes we are looking at. Uh, in the stage two, which we have called early stage, that's where we are taking uh, some uh, methods, some PAT method into deployment. We are starting to use the first couple of PAT methods in the site or in the company. Uh, at stage three, we are more in an emerging uh, phase uh, where we are more having more than one PAT method and we are starting to get multiple PAT methods across the site or across the company. Uh, and of course, the transition from uh, stage three where we are emerging into stage four, uh, where we are strategic, that's where uh, we are starting to think about PAT as an important tool to achieve um, the objectives we have in our business. Uh, and then, of course, uh, moving into operationalized, that's where, as I said, PAT is really part of uh, of what we are doing. You know, the way I like to look at these, there's there's five stages, but there's four attributes that, that change with as we go progress through these stages. The first one is level of integration, meaning connectedness of PAT systems. The level of ambition, meaning how aggressive, how bigger we're going for the big business impacts as we go up this Curve. Third one is collaboration, meaning the scope of, of uh, organizational scope of PAT. Yeah. More, pe more and more people get involved. And then four is the level of formality, uh, meaning the codification, the documentation strategies, procedures, and management procedures. Yeah, no, definitely. And, and also, as we um, took this uh, slide a step further. We are always starting to look there at the bottom of the, of the slide on uh, both the cost and the savings. And that is giving a picture on, based on the four bullet points you laid out there, uh, Chuck, how, how are we seeing the benefit from uh, the PAT methods? And the one thing we can't avoid to talk about is of course that introducing PAT methods or ut using PAT methods, it does have a cost. There is an expense both the hardware, software, uh, and actually doing it. But the way we are seeing this is that uh, the incremental cost per method, as we are moving through the stages from certainly from stage two to three, uh, the incremental cost per PAT method is actually starting to level off. We are getting um, the benefit of, of large scale, lots of instrumentation, uh, software which is scalable and all of that. And that means that per new method uh, in stage three and four and onwards, uh, it's uh, less incremental cost. Having said that, nice. the savings, which is the blue shape here, we see that that is uh, increasing uh, the more integrated we are getting uh, PAT into our um, business or into our operations. Uh, and saving is really uh, improved operation. So it's like avoiding the waste, which was talked about in an earlier slide, uh, and also then uh, doing things in a better way. Uh, but the true innovation here, the actual improvements, that's something we have labeled business growth uh, because this is actually, call it new money, as we will talk about later, but this is where we are not only optimizing the uh, processes we have, but also starting to innovate based on those processes, uh, based on our understanding, which is developing through the PAT methods. We are getting new insights, which we can then uh, take into consideration and get uh, improvements in our business. And these two, the savings and the business growth, they are of course additive. So uh, the total improvement in our operations, in our bottom line, uh, is really based on those two uh, components together. Great, yeah. thanks Kevin. Yeah, absolutely. I think, uh, yeah, and it, it, the, the next uh, slide is basically just another view of this slide. And essentially, it's the business impact, but uh, 
seen a little bit differently, seen from the perspective of business propositions. And Yaruna already saved me some time here because the first row is called save money, middle row make more money, and lower row is make new money. So save money is all about protecting existing assets, uh, incremental improvements, uh, squeezing out some efficiencies, so the types of things. Make more money is uh, you know, expanding operational uh, capacity of your existing assets to produce new products or produce new or improve products and services. The last row I briefly referred to earlier uh, is the innovation row. This is where we talk about disruptive radical technologies, especially in biotech. This is the this is the paradigm. There's new new manufacturing processes that will be developed, innovative, radical. Uh, PAT supports innovation. PAT is yep. not just about squeezing out a little bit of gain here or there. It supports innovation. Yeah. Couldn't say it better myself, Chuck. Spot on. <laughs> <laughs> Great, Chuck. And now, now we're, we're getting into the meat of everything. We're change. <laughs> we're, we're talking about you know our view on how we should fast track our results and some of the best practices and the pitfalls to avoid. Um, this is stage yeah. one, Yaruna, here, right? It, it is, yes. And what we have tried to do here in the following slides is that we're trying to look on each of these stages and we are trying to give some advice, some pointers to, to best practices and also pointing to obvious uh, pitfalls we want to avoid. Um, and the first thing we just want to highlight before discussing the, the slide itself is these two lanes. It's the tech line and it's the soft skill uh, lane. Uh, and that's important because uh, the tech line is all about um, the methods, the hardware, the measurement uh, approaches and all of that stuff, uh, which is important and key for us to be able to do PAT in a proper way, of course. Uh, but the soft lane is equally important because that is to do with, okay, how do we now integrate these technical uh, improvements into our operations? How do we gain the benefit uh, in actually um, handling or running our processes? Uh, through the improved information or insight we are getting from the from the tech side of it. So if we are going to be successful at PAT, we really need to take both the tech side and the, the soft skill side into, into consideration. Um, and the first uh, stage here, uh, where we are testing out the, the new uh, PAT tool as a possible contender or a tool at our site, uh, the first point to make is that it's all about keeping it simple, starting from something which is proven earlier not reinvent the wheel but look to other uh, other companies look to uh, the literature and understand okay what is proven technologies here keep it simple and ensure that you're getting success in that first test yeah the other the note there about don't use black box approaches uh this is yeah, i was gonna ask philosophy. about that yeah no sorry beat you too no, i mean no I, I, you're <laughs> We think alike. <laughs> I was black box to me means lack of transparency. Uh, uh, and Camo's for for since its inception has been about uh, transparency in multivariate analysis. And so it's exploratory. Even in this exploratory stage, it's important to to understand, be able to look into your models, uh, into your uh, methods to see what they're doing. Hmm. So I guess there are some methods that aren't transparent. Well, uh, some some are yeah. Uh, there's some that uh, a lot of the machine learning type methods. The uh, some it, it, and sometimes transparency isn't really a function of the mathematics itself, but more of the software, what the software allows you to see. Um, so I'm not putting down machine learning. I'm not putting down uh, neural nets and such. Uh, what I'm saying is so the software should allow some transparency to allow the user to understand what's happening. And sometimes regulators require that transparency yeah. if you're going to yeah. file something. Yeah. So I guess, I guess to summarize stage one, you want to keep it simple and understand everything that you're going to be careful around rolling this out. Make sure you have a clear plan. Yep. And, yep. As, and as we move on to uh, stage two here, am I on stage two? Sorry, I'm yes. uh, this is, a little delay. This is stage two. <laughs> No, this is stage two, yes. And this is where uh, we have the ambition to have more than the one PAT method, right? We, we are starting to have 
uh, multiple PAT methods and we are starting to put them out into our uh, lines. And of course, now we need to consider this uh, feasibility element. Is it really feasible to put it into operation? Is it something uh, which can be running if it's a continuous manufacturing rig? Is it um, uh, capable of running 24 seven? Uh, and also in terms of the PAT methods we are putting on there, what type of information are we getting out? Is the information we are getting out, is it relevant and actionable? Uh, or is it just uh, noise uh, on the dashboard of the operators? Uh, and of course, right. there is also this element of thinking a little bit ahead uh, and thinking about, okay, we are starting to get some nice insights, some nice data and results here. How do we actually take care of them uh, so that it's uh, possible to build on this and not really stop uh, and, uh, and, and break off? Yeah, the, the very good points. Uh, the only things I could think of that is the operability. The ease, it refers to the ease of use as well as the robustness. And ease of use means not just PAT scientists, it means operators, it means shift supervisors and so forth. Mm -hmm. uh, scalable yep. tools, that means don't get stuck in a rut. Uh, you want to start with a tool that you can scale up, scale down as business yep. uh, dictates. And then compliance is dropped. Uh, we're compliant, non-compliant tool, avoid those. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. Even if it's not not a, a GMP operations, mm -hmm. uh, at some point it might become a GMP operation, in which case you don't want to be stuck in a rut of a non-compliant yeah. tool. Yeah. Yeah, and, and also as you are getting these successes, right, it's important to communicate this, to start yeah. to get the buy-in from the wider company. And that's also all important when we're moving into the stage three, right? Uh, because yeah. at the stage three, uh, that's where we are starting to actually make a dent into this. Uh, and at this stage, we are moving into a bigger impact on our operations. And this element about uh, change management consideration is really coming in. And of course, we need the key stakeholders to have our backs, to put it that way. Uh, because now we are starting to uh, get operational in a sense. Uh, the PAT methods that are out there in our processes, they are making an impact. And we need to then ensure that, okay, uh, what we are doing here is is consistent and to some extent like future proof, right? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, I wanted, wanted to emphasize the point about the automation and IT key stakeholders. Uh, IT automation become very key stakeholders. They were earlier stages, but they are even more so now. Uh, so uh, be nice to them, take care of them, send them donuts in the morning, coffee. Uh, try to get on their good side because you're going to need them. Uh, the other thing, of course, uh, on the lower left, uh, closed environment tools, one vendor solutions. Really, a, a, at this maturity level onward, we really need to avoid those. Um, uh, they might work very well for one PAT vendor, but it but that doesn't necessarily work for your solution. You might have multiple uh, instrument vendors and process systems you need to work with. Yes, and, and that plays to the point we made earlier about incremental cost, right? Uh, that if we are going to succeed in lowering the incremental cost, it needs to be some sort of thinking around, okay, how are our tools scalable? How is our strategy scalable? Uh, and, and that's also, in, in this stage, we are, and uh, it's necessary for us to do what we call operational considerations, right? How do the tools fit into the existing infrastructure and how, as right. you said, Chuck, how, how do we relate to the automation? But as we are moving into the, the stage four then, uh, this is not only considerations anymore, but it's really key because at stage four, that, that's where we have the um, uh, strategic approach to uh, to PAT. And that means that it's not only considerations, it's actually something we really have to, to deal with. Uh, right. It needs to be an integration as we're putting it on, on this uh, slide. And not the least, we're also getting into the uh, life cycle strategies, right? Because we have put something in place which have a operational impact, hopefully improving our ways of working. And then we need to think about how do we maintain this over time? How do we ensure that as we are changing uh, raw material windows, as we are changing equipment, how do we maintain the benefit we're already gained? Yeah, yeah, because this is, let's get back to the property of what I'll call the codification or formalization. So things are much more formal here. We have to lay out uh, what the strategies are, what the cost centers are, all these logistical things have to be laid out at this stage. Hmm. Um, certainly one thing that's mentioned there on the right, upper right is the PAT site champion. And my personal opinion on that is it's very important to have a site champion, even at earlier stages, 
but certainly so at the strategic stage because uh, uh, experience at DuPont was you can't just uh, what we call throw it over the fence, throw the analyzer over the fence and let the site uh, take care of it. Someone on site every day, day in, day out has to be uh, the champion for that or it's just the non-sustainable solution. Yes, and th at this stage, you are really going to suffer if you haven't thought through how you are going to realize how you're going to implement this, right? Uh, so, right. so this is a it's a big downfall here or a big pitfall. Uh, There's a potential, uh, potential, but that's not. That's a good point because then once the inspectors uh, pay visits, they expect to see documents, they expect to see procedures all formalized. If you're not ready for them, uh, that can be painful. No yeah. Sorry, yes. sorry, sorry to put it that way, but <laughs> honestly, it's a virtual joke. <laughs> right, uh, and in stage five, uh, this is where something we have labeled operational, right? And operational that means that um, now PAT is really part of what the organization is doing. Uh, it's a tool at par with the other uh, hardware, uh, the other tools which is used in, in production. Uh, and this is the stage where you can start to think about, okay, uh, we have the uh, local applications, we have the local PAT methods, of course, but now we can also start to think about using this information globally because we can think about, okay, we have a, a network of sites maybe doing uh, different or same products, and we can start to compare the different sites. We can start to see, okay, how can site A uh, teach anything which we can uh, use to improve the site B? Uh, and not the least at this stage also, if we are not uh, having proper life cycle management on our methods, models, systems, uh, then we are in, in real trouble. Uh, and not the least, uh, when we have PAT as an established tool, we also need to ensure that um, the PAT is part of what not only the PAT experts are doing, but also the other uh, people who are working in, in operations. And that means that we need to think about, okay, how do we ensure that we have the right skill level in the organization? Is it by partnering or is it by internal training, internal uh, competency centers? Yeah, this is a, what I like to call the aspirational stage or the holy grail yeah. stage. I'm not sure anyone has really been there or gotten here yet. Now, I'll hold up a sign that says, I don't think anyone's here, prove me wrong. <laughs> uh, I'd love to yeah. see someone walk up and say, no, we're here, um, uh, because this is really the, the where we really want to be, yeah. and top, very yeah. polished uh, procedures, and uh, PAT, this is what I like, also like to call PAT, is just a part of doing business. It's not <laughs> yes, exactly. expensive. And holy graph, right? <laughs> but, but this is also the stage where we are pointing forward, and I think, I agree with you, Chuck, that I haven't seen any this uh, fully but also I've seen in some companies they have pockets right they have some uh, certainly connected with the continuous manufacturing rigs they have some really good knowledge uh, which is pocketed there and also some of the teams some of the local teams they have some good strategies and good solutions uh, but of course when PAT is operationalized that's also pointing forward to the um, Pharma 4.0 or the digitalization itself and that is a it's a bigger strategic objective in some sense, but definitely PAT is a tool or is uh, belonging as a part of that bigger objective. So, so that, that's the interesting part, uh, because this is where we are really opening up for growth opportunities. That's a good point, Sierra. And I guess we this kind of summarizes it, right, Chuck? Are you there, Chuck? We're live. Sorry, so. I apologize. I was <laughs> muted. <laughs> I heard an echo, so I muted myself. Uh, uh, yeah, absolutely. You're absolutely right, Jeff. The, the main content to add here is the kind of the schematic on the left, the, the pseudo graph showing that the business and operational impact increased exponentially as the level of integration, the level of uh, the stages. And everything, mm -hmm. everything else here is like Aruna said, you have the tech side and the soft skill side. Both are critical. Both are have critical elements in them. Um, this is a nice summary slide to yeah, summarize the, the, the last five. Yeah. Yep. So the big question: Why now? You know, we spoke about a lot today. Yeah. And here are some of the the quotes that we went over. You know, why now? Yeah. The first thing about the the, the quote from the former FDA director talking about the Renaissance. 
Uh, it's kind of funny or ironic to think of a renaissance of PAT since, uh, you know, it's been around since 2004. But I, I agree. I agree. Uh, it hasn't gotten the traction I think it's it's been able, potentially able to get. So I think historically, PAT is written on the backs of other quality initiatives, things like Six Sigma, yeah. Just in Time, uh, Continuous Improvement. Uh, hardware robustness is better now. Oh, sorry. I was missing. Yeah, uh, I, yeah the hardware and the robust, the robustness of the hardware and the software is better. Um, and I think there's more regulatory clarity. Uh, not crystal clear. I won't. This is just my opinion, but I think okay. there's more clarity around IC with ICH guidances, uh, other guidances coming from regulators. I think yeah. that helps the regulatory risk. Yeah. I think so, uh, but, but I also think that, uh, okay, you have that uh, regulatory side of it, but uh, I think we shouldn't underestimate the hardware development. You pointed to it, uh, Chuck, in terms of robustness, but there have also been some, some great innovation, both in sensor technology, and also there have been leaps in what we could call data infrastructure, right? So, so there are yeah. drivers here which are technical drivers as well. And if we are looking out there, and maybe we should include software as well, since we are a little bit interested in that. Uh, if we are looking out what's in the market today and what is available off the shelf, really, compared to what was available off the shelf in 2004, it clearly, it's a much shorter journey now from no PAT to a strategic or operationalized PAT today than it's ever been. Yeah. Uh, and it's easier uh, to, to make those leaps, I would say. Yes. Absolutely. So I guess this is kind of reflect on internal reflection of the people listening to this, you know, just going through the questions here, where is the potential in your process to apply PAT? What is preventing your company from unlocking more of the value of PAT? And these are the type of questions you really should be asking yourself. And then one thing to note here is resource up, do not go out alone. There's a lot of different ways you could kind of get guidance around what to do. Um, companies like ourselves, for that matter, you know, we've been in this game a while and we have expertise on both sides of the fence to kind of guide guide and help answer these type of questions. And uh, to kind of give you a, an idea of what we're doing here, this is the first round of uh, the web, our webinar series. We're going to go more into some different applications in the future, but we do have an opportunity here to kind of apply to attend one of the industry roundtables so we could have this type of a discussion with people around the industry, around the table. Um, we have two coming up, one where you're new to PAT, and then the second one is level three stage or higher. So you'll be getting an invitation via email. So this is where we're going to be answering some questions, and I do see some questions coming in. So the first question, how to select the right kind of PAT tools, like when to use NIR or when to use Raman or any other PAT tool? Yeah. That's a very good question, and that I guess is, is my, my degree is in analytical chemistry, uh, and so that part of the analytical chemistry curriculum is precisely answering that question. You're given a problem, and you have to decide which analytical method, and laboratory analytical method, is appropriate for that method. And so there has to be. A, this is a common theme in a lot of uh, applications, and that's domain knowledge, understanding uh, your system. Um, both the chemistry, the spectroscopy, the biology, the process dynamics, yep. and so forth. So, um, it's, it, it, Raman and NIR is a tough is a, is is one that uh, I'll, I'll hand it off to Giaruna about the Raman versus NIR. Maybe. Yeah, because I I think Chuck that uh, the way to see this is that it's it's two ways, right? It's interfacing to the to the line or to the process, and then it's about uh, the measurement and what are we actually measuring. Uh, and clearly, Roman and their infrared, they are measuring different parts of this uh, electromagnetic spectrum, which means that we are getting different properties of the molecules, right? So it, it really depends when we are making that decision, which uh, measurement method or which instrumentation should we be using. It's all about, okay, what are we trying to measure here? W what is really the uh, critical quality attributes of a critical process parameter we are trying to characterize through uh, PAT, uh, and that can certainly guide us in choosing the PAT method. Uh, but then, of course, there is also this um, uh, question, uh, the more open question about, okay, what what type of um, uh, measurement interface do we have? 
because that's coming into Raman and their infrared was mentioned there. Infrared is another one in the same vein. But of course, there is also now new uh, opportunities in terms of uh, more or less atline chromatography and, and that kind of tools as well, which gives us a much wider range than ever to actually do different types of measurements. But it comes down to the key question, okay, what are you trying to do here? And if you don't know that yourself, clearly uh, a good way of um, getting to know it is to talk with someone who knows. And that is um, uh, to Jeff's point about partnering up, right? Find someone who knows a little bit about this and, and discuss with them. Yeah, the, 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 the old adage about process analytical was uh, like 90% of the problems are sampling related. Really. And yeah. I kind of agree with that. I think you're going to make a good point about the sampling interface. What it's not just about the analytical chemistry from the classical sense of what this type of spectroscopy is, what the interface is going to look like, the quality of the sampling, how good of a sample you're going to get. Uh, I've seen many cases where a lot of time and money's been spent on probes and instruments only to realize that the sampling is so substandard that the measurement is rendered useless. So be very uh, deliberate about how you're going to sample. Thanks, Chuck. We have another question. What will be the impact of scale-up process on the inline models? Yeah, oh. that's uh, a <laughs> Chuck, let you take well, that. Well, <laughs> yeah, it, 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 it's a somewhat vague question, but I, yeah, if you're talking about a scenario where you have a, 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 an inline probe or an outline method and your process changes, it's always a, a I know at Merck we had to go through what are called uh, uh, equivalency protocols uh, on analytical methods, both both lab analytical and process analytical. We, we modeled our transfer protocols off the laboratory methods because inherently you have to assume that when you change the process, whether that be a scale up or change of location or venue or type of manufacturing, you have to make that inherent assumption that it could affect uh, the efficacy of the method, and therefore you need to do some some equivalency studies uh, on the scale up. Yep, and and this is no, uh, it is something which needs to be thought about and it needs to be done properly. Uh, but it's the same thing if you want to move a process from lab scale to manufacturing scale, you will also need to do engineering scale up, right? You need to prove that, okay, my process is still valid in these bigger containers. And the sort of transition we are looking for is happening in, in a right way. Uh, and that, that's the same thing for right. the PAT methods. So I would say, of course, you need to look on scale up issues or challenges uh, with the PAT method, but that's no different from uh, scaling up the process itself. It's a little bit different approach to it, of course, but it's the same type of challenge. And um, you can't, you, if you're looking on uh, a small volume where your probe is uh, measuring maybe a, a big percentage of that volume at once, and you're going to a big, uh, big uh, container, which your probe is only uh, measuring a fraction, of course, you need to do some considerations and in terms of what uh, type of information you're getting in those two uh, sizes or those two scales, and, and you yeah. need to adjust accordingly, exactly as you were saying in, in your example there, Chuck. Yeah, they, 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 the thing about PAT as opposed to regular analytical or classical analytical is you're much more intimately uh, connected to the process. And that means yeah. when process needs to be validated, the PAT sampling interface and PAT has to be validated with the process. It's just yeah, it yeah. has to be part yeah. of the integration and the validation scheme. True, but it's also, I think it's as easy as uh, this is a challenge for all types of sensors, right? If, if I'm going to measure the temperature, in a bigger container, I need to consider where am I actually measuring that temperature and how quickly is the temperature changing through my volume. So it's not only PAT, it's all types of sensors. It's all, all type of information from those uh, different manufacturing operations, right? Yeah, yeah it's all the sensors have to, be, yeah, yeah. have to be considered in the transfer. Great, thanks guys. Uh, I don't think we have any more questions, but um, I know we went a little bit over today and we are sending this presentation out. So if there are any questions, and we're not, we're, we're not gonna be live all day, of course, uh, this is our contact information where you could send questions directly to us. Um, and I think there's also a, an option uh, through the webinar. So I guess without any further ado, let's we have some parting comments from our uh, 
panelists here, Garuna or Chuck, anything to say? <laughs> no, I was saying saying goodbye. No, this uh, is an exciting okay. time. It's a, it's actually it's a good time to get involved for the reasons you mentioned. You know, the regulatory climate, the uh, technology. It, it, it's, it's 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 an exciting time. Uh, we're I think uh, Camo Analytics were well positioned to support uh, all of you in, in your journey, whether you're starting out from scratch or you're old veterans looking to expand your horizons a bit. Great. Thanks, guys. And again, look out for our next uh, webinar coming up. And I'm forgetting what it's on, but it's definitely more driven at specific applications. But until then, we're going to be parting ways. So take care, everyone. And thanks for joining. Yep. Bye-bye. Okay. Take care. Bye.